Previously on System Mastery. I am Locutus, a Borg. Resistance is futile. Your life as it has been is over. From this time forward, you will service us. Mr. Worf. Fire. And now, the thrilling conclusion. Hello, and welcome to System Mastery, the only podcast where I do the intro. Jesus Christ, that was way too much energy. Hello. There we go. Well, Dial it down. Welcome to System Mastery. Pretend you're me. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad that I'm recording. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, hello, everybody. I'm Jeff, the... Host of uh, System Mastery, the podcast where we review the old one and games. only host. <laughs> and with me, as always, <laughs> is the janitor here at System Mastery headquarters, uh-huh. Old Man John. Yeah, damn it, <laughs> John. Your kids keep backing up the toilet. I told you, <laughs> take smaller dumps. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying, Old Man John. Come I, on, break it down. I've for been, me. <laughs> Sometimes I just do it in the shower and just sort of mash it in with my hand. I don't know if that's bad or... Yeah, that's what you do. That's how the professionals do it. <laughs> that's how they did it in the war. <laughs> uh, well, thank you. Anyway, yeah. our, the co-host of the show, John, and I am also a co-host of the show. Yeah. Yeah. I'm the host of System Mastery, and so is John. Yeah. Is that fair? There. Can there I say you that? You, there's no co-emperors. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> Sure there are. I think that's the second to last boss of uh, Encourage 40. <laughs> yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah, we're the two emperors yeah. of System Mastery, and you have to beat us <laughs> to fight Cthune. <laughs> oh, Christ. <laughs> <laughs> this week, we are doing the back half of the Immortal. Yeah. The Invisible War. And let me tell you, it's got a really wonky front end, but the back half. Yeah, you want to get in that back half. That's the good stuff. Little in the middle. But she's got much back half. <laughs> She's got much back half. Wait, is back half a kind of Canadian bacon? That's like a that's like a pig cut you can get, right? Let me get somebody. Oh, three pounds of back half. Well, you had like uh, three pounds of that back half, eh? <laughs> Wait, back cafe? Yeah, back cafe. The bat cafe? <laughs> it's one of those things that's well labeled in the bat cave. <laughs> okay. Oh my god, that was some stream of consciousness to shit. Okay, where are we? Okay, immortal, uh, immortal, the invisible, the war. invisible war, and the thing that we have to discuss this week. Is the lore. There's so much lore to this. We, I, I had mentioned this earlier, but we had barely gotten into, uh, like, the terms. <laughs> and even with the terms in there that are just the mechanical terms, you still kind of have to get into the lore, because they only make sense in as far as that lore exists. Yeah. In fact, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the timeline of the game right now. Which is great, because it's like the first thing you get there in the whole book is this timeline. And the timeline makes no sense and is not explained at all. It's maddening. And not only is it a little maddening, but also, this book has about four full color sections. And of those, one of them is art, and three of them are just text on full color for some reason. Oh yeah, the uh, this timeline is full color, but all they did was put a pink border around it and put it on a pink page... So that you could read the timeline of Immortal with pinkness. Yeah, it just seems like a weird use of money. I mean, I'm not, I'm not complaining. I'm not judging their willingness to spend money on dumb things when printing their book, but I am. John is. So there you go. The old janitor has a problem with that. Go darn it! My day, we didn't spend money on that. (laughs) Had to spend that money killing the Kaiser. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I'll let you have the janitor character. I'll, I'll quit doing the janitor character. How dare you, sir? I'm sorry. How dare you make fun of the janitor? He's right here, and he's sad about that. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, old janitor John. Oh, damn it. Why? Why you gotta go and hurt my feelings? What did you actually do to defeat the Kaiser? 
Why, I went into his bathroom and I stuck a little plumber up. Whoa there, hey now. <laughs> Jeez. Okay, so let's start from the beginning of this uh, background. 65 million BC, the Sanguinary appears out of the Crucible and is shattered into shards known as Conundrum. Yeah, I feel like all we would really need to do for this is just line by line attempt to explain what every dumb term is. Oh, well, it's like three pages, so I'll just skip to the more interesting ones as we go. Well, eventually we will have explained everything in a line. Oh, okay, sure. All right, well then let's start. Uh, What's the Sanguinary? That's this game's devil, right? Uh, sort of, because it's... It's less like, oh, there's a heaven and a hell and a, like, demon and a god. It's just the crucible, the other thing it mentions in there, is sort of heaven-ish. Yeah. Like, it's, it's creation. It's, it's, it's the font of creation, right? Yeah, it's very, the flood is what comes out of the crucible, and that just sort of gives life to everything. Wait, the worst part of every Halo game comes out of the crucible? Yeah, you can blame the crucible for the flood. I mean, it's always the worst part of those Halo games. Yeah, every time I'm playing that Halo game, and then I'm like, trying to build an arc, and then the flood comes? <laughs> yeah. Hell? God damn it. Alright. Yeah. So there's at least one more word in here. So the Sanguinary is kind of the anti-crucible. The crucible is a font of creation. The Sanguinary is sort of a force of Well, the Sanguinary malice. came out of the crucible. Yeah. So there's... It never states this in the book, but I feel like the crucible is supposed to be like a fourth dimensional type, like some unknowable being got banished from there and fell here and that's why shit goes all crazy. Okay. It's because it's like... Oh, I'm a being made out of pure energy from the fifth dimension. Yeah, okay. you gotta watch out for those beings from the fifth dimension. I mean, you got oh, your yeah. mix, you have spit licks and your uh, bat mites. Yeah, man, every everything that comes out of that fifth dimension, terrible. Yeah, I'm, r- just, I'm real racist just, against the fifth dimension. Just the worst. <sighs> also, the dredge are pure energy, and those guys suck, so... Yeah, anything that is pure energy and or comes from the fifth dimension. Terrible. Yeah. No we one's should gonna, start a registry for them. No one's going to get my Titan AE reference. No. So Why I, would they? No one watched that. That was garbage. The movie's amazing and you're terrible. Uh, I mean, one of those is true. I'll let you pick which one. <laughs> Fine. I'm going to say that Titan AE is amazing. Such is my, the strength of my <laughs> convictions. You don't, you're not terrible. You just suck. Yeah. All right. There's one more word in there we need to explain, which is conundrum. <laughs> Okay, so conundrums are almost like the artifacts in this game, mm-hmm. except they are tainted pieces of the Sanguinary. Yeah. So if you've ever watched, uh, what was that sci-fi show? It was like Room 13 or something? The Librarian. No. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Room 13. Yeah. Okay. No, <laughs> Battlestar Galactica, Caprica. Yeah, that that was it. Do you, you remember in Caprica with all those magical artifacts? <laughs> yeah. And Pat Oswald, I think, was there. Yeah, yeah, it was great. Uh, but you know where it was like, oh, if I have a comb and I can use it to stop time, or I have a flask and it steals your breath and shit like that. What is? It? Why do they always put freaking time stop into every sci-fi thing? It's hey. it's the stu- oh, it's so bad for for uh, writing. Well, the worse than time stop is time travel. Yes, because time travel immediately makes it so that as soon as you have access to it, everyone goes, well, why don't you just fix it? Yeah, and then you have to be like, well, because the character who has time travel powers is ridiculous anime (laughs) man-baby fucking heroes. Uh, Well, it's the same problem you have with the Flash. Anytime the Flash fights someone, you're like, well, why didn't he light speed win? And they're like, I don't know. He was feeling dumb. Well, I'd say the major problem I've had with the Flash is that he runs and manages to go back in time at the point (laughs) where he still can't run like Mach 1 yet. He's like, Uh, oh, I can run like 400 miles an hour and I ran back in time. I'm like, I don't feel like... You know what my big problem with The Flash is? Is that he's Barry Allen? Yeah, Barry Allen is definitely The Flash. Of of the people who are The Flash, it's Barry Allen. Uh, (laughs) Anyway. Uh, So, so yeah, the, the conundrum... The conundrum are weird pieces that will do stuff. They have... Generally magic powers, but they, like, will corrupt you if you get near them. Yeah, and also they are basically rubies. They are crusty, evil, artifact rubies. Yeah. Yeah. Much much like me, they are crusty and evil. (laughs) More crust than mad now. (laughs) Okay, the next one says... 62 million BC, so we're we're jumping 3 million years ahead on the old time chart. <laughs> yeah, 3 million years, not a lot happened. But various Saurian species, symbiotically joined to the conundrum, become immortal. These creatures, the Abzudim, haunt the, or hunt the rest of the surviving <laughs> they dinosaurs. They haunt them. They haunt them dinosaurs. Ooh, boogins. Boogins, you dinosaur. The dinosaur's just like, 
<laughs> okay, so I love that one. Because Saurian, you can kind of understand. That's fine. Mm -hmm. And the Absalom are just immortal, intelligent dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, rad. That's awesome. But then it says that the reason that dinosaurs went extinct is because intelligent dinosaurs hunted the rest of the dinosaurs. That seems like it would take a while. Like, like a really long while. Especially because it's not like, oh yeah, there are like hundreds of thousands of millions of intelligent dinosaurs that are now hunting the rest of them. Like, from what I can gather, there are probably... Maybe a thousand. The other thing is that it's not like humans are hunting the animals to extinction. I mean, yeah, we did that to the whales over the course of the 1800s, but these days, we're mostly foresting and land-growing them out of out of being alive. And that's still just one thing, like, oh, we were hunting specifically whales. Yeah. Dinosaurs covers a pretty broad spectrum. Yeah, I mean, imagine if we were to be like, okay, people, we're going to render birds extinct. I just, I declare a jihad on birds. Yeah. I will kill every bird in the world, and I'll, I'm going to do it. Me. I'll take care of it. So, every bird I see, and I'll just... That's just me. I'll just be Johnny Bird Killer Seed, wandering the land, killing birds. And will I get it done? No, I will not, because birds will outbreed me. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if you're an immortal and you continually kill as many birds as you find. You're going to be like, well... I finally managed to kill all of the birds on this continent. However, the birds that I had killed on a different continent have now repopulated, so god damn it. Yeah. So. It's like working at a Target and you clean up one section and you go to another section and now it's dirty again. I hated working at a Target. Target's terrible. Everyone out there, don't shop at Target. They're not our sponsor. <laughs> Unless they sponsor us. And in, which case we, in that case, we love Target. Yeah. 60 million BC, the Sunedrion, a tree whose roots reached into the crucible after the Sanguinary's arrival, attained sentience and began spreading seedlings throughout the dominions. Great. So the Sunedrion are intelligent trees? Yeah, they're like Yggdrasils. Yeah, so you've got some that still exist, but the original Sunedrion is that one. And I don't understand how its roots can go into the crucible, but whatever, that's fine. Uh, for fifth dimension. Yeah, my fish, fish, fish dimension. dimension. My you, fish dimension. You traveled through the fish dimension. Yeah, that's yeah. my roots went into the fish dimension, <laughs> and I got Gordons. <laughs> God, I don't even have a good follow up joke to that. That's just a regular <laughs> mouth slip. There's nothing you can do about it. Yep. Nope. It's it's my Freudian slip. I got fish on the brain. It's true. You got that super fetish for fish. <laughs> that, that super fetish. Man, fish fetish is fun to say, by the way. <laughs> All right. Then uh, we also have to explain what uh, the Dominions are in this case. Uh, s kind of like the ethereal plane. Yeah, basically. They're like the space from which you're more... Wait, no, I'm thinking of the habitat. No, wait. The habitat is the human plane. And what, and, uh. So that's like normal mortal realm. And immor the immortals are from. The Dominion the is the immortal plane okay. where if you're an immortal, you hang out in the Dominions. So it's probably not so much ethereal as it is like those specific outer planes that are out on the astral. So it's like the happy hunting grounds or Bitopia, which I think actually are the same thing. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> the plane of concordant opposition or perhaps Mechanus. Yeah, so these are weird in that I'm I'm not sure. Again, this book throws so many terms at you, and even when you've read it like a couple times, I can't tell if like dinosaurs and the bugs and animals and everything that are supposed to have become immortal lived in the Dominions originally and then went over to the habitat later, or if they were in the habitat and becoming immortal shoved them into the Dominions. Like, there's no clear answer here. No. Which, you'd think, because there's dinosaur bones in the habitat, because we live in the habitat, that they would have been there first. And then we jump 10 million years to the 50 million BC mark, where the Tautha and Morrigan prides come into being. Now, we didn't talk about prides at all in the previous podcast, so this is probably a good point to jump into the prides. All right, so there are a grip of prides... They each have a bunch of different crap they can do, and they they have two different sections in this book where they describe them. Yes. One gives you the actual description of it, mm -hmm. and the other one does your standard white wolf dumb thing where it tells you what they think about other stuff. Oh, I hate that section in any book that has it, It's because it's always some pithy little half-threat thing. It's well, always like, what do werewolves think of vampires? They are weak and stupid. We will destroy them if they do not destroy themselves. 
Yeah, think great. about it. That's what every werewolf thinks of every vampire. It's also Good. basically what every werewolf thinks about everything, because all they can do is be snarky at each other. And every time you find one of those, what do these people think about these people? Snarky bullshit. What about these guys? Snarky bullshit. Oh yeah, there's never like, oh those guys are okay, I guess. Yeah, it's always like, well we're bird people, so we'll fly above them on wings of danger, danger wings. Good band. I'd see Danger Wings. Oh, yeah, I would see Danger Wings in concert. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, the first ones that were mentioned there were the Tautha and the Morrigan, but I figure we should just go through them in alphabetical order. Because that way you won't hear as many page flips, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize right now. You're going to hear some page flipping, because there's no way we are going to be able to hold this in our head. No, you would need to be immortal to hold all this information in your head. A tiny meat brain like ours cannot contain this entire book. No, I would have to be some kind of Aramite in order to do that. <laughs> nice. Well, way to actually remember one. Yeah. Here, I'll do it too. Terat. Good job. All right. So the first one is the Anopheles. And they are one of the eldest prides. And they were in servitude to the dread Absalim. So if you remember that, those are the dinosaur immortals. Yeah, so for a while, these guys were stuck working for dinosaur immortals. And their big thing is, uh, they're... I, I like the sensates, I want to say. They're yeah, like, they're, they're like the ones who like to experience they're things. They're hedonism bots. Yeah. They, they love sex, and they love doing cool stuff, but they also are all about, like, talking. So they're very political, but also very big on sensory input. I'm looking, John's looking at the actual description of who they are and what they're like. I'm looking at the page that's just the uh, pithy thoughts about them and, and information. Kind of like how, you know, in Exalted, where they have the uh, the, sec- the sobriquets and so on, where it's like, what do you occasionally call Twilight's? Copper spiders. Oh yeah, the arrows of heaven. Yeah, no one, no one calls them that. No, that's not real. <laughs> but, but uh, the problem is, is that uh, it's a little esoteric and silly to read a lot of it in time. So, Anopheles. First, let's start with their predilections: Bohemian, Kabbalist, Connoisseur, Heretic, Paramour, Preternatural, Rake, Surrealist, the Sycophant, Thrill Seeker. Now, uh, that just means basically nothing. Yep. Uh, they do have. Again, like White Wolf, back in the day, uh, you would have your nature, and so you'd be like, I'm nature, jester, or gallant, or whatever you happen to be. And that was uh, just sort of your uh, personality type, but it didn't really have much to do. You could occasionally gain willpower from it. But in here, it does literally nothing. It's to help you roleplay and nothing else. Like, if I write down bon vivant on my sheet, that means dick. Yeah. Now, if I write preternatural on my sheet, it's that because also I'm Anne Dick. It's Everything means Dick. No, it's because I'm Anne Rice. <laughs> <laughs> Damn you, Anne Rice. Okay, location of Kresh. And John, what's a Kresh? Man, I don't know. You don't remember Kresh? Kresh is like their base. Like when they're playing oh, Immortal that's Tag. That's right. Yeah. When they're playing Immortal Tag, they can run back to their Kresh and be like, base. <laughs> Kresh, you can't touch me. You can't touch me. I'm in my Kresh. Kresh is basically like the, the, the magic place where they live. And it's if you go there, it's a mythic version of it. Uh, theirs is the Karakoram mountain peaks on the borders of India and Pakistan. Then it tells us what they look like. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these because I think there's ten prides or something like that. But just so you know, Anopheles are always fashion conscious, preferring dark colors such as wine red, midnight blue, and black. Often they have a red teardrop tattooed under <laughs> one of their eyes. They favor sensual or erotic clothing accessories to, sta- to distinguish one another within the pride, as well as the use of leather lingerie, and metal combinations. Great. So they're like Lady Death or Dawn or any of those 90s pin-up model comic book characters. Vampirella. They're Witchblade. They're any of that. Yeah, sure. That's great. Uh, And I think the Anopheles Anopheles are also the ones who uh, taught humans the Relegarum That's correct. Yeah, they did. So uh, Relegarum, we mentioned in the previous one, which is human belief can shape uh, the immortals. So if a human believes something hard enough, he can fuck with you. And they were the ones who tried to turn that into a weapon, and then those humans rebelled and became their own society. Correct. Now, uh, a couple more things about the Anopheles to give you an idea of how character design works in this game. First, we get to see their quiet cultures. Do you remember what the quiet or the quiet cultures are at all? Quiet cultures are sort of like cults, yes, but they are uh, humans that are helpful to immortals, unlike the uh, the society that came from the original Relegarum users, who are 
of course, shit like Templars, because yeah. you always have Templars in every one of these games. Of course, you need Templars in every single game ever. And they're also the Illuminati, because yeah. they're both. So, quiet cultures basically are the cultures throughout history that have supported this particular type of immortal. This information is worthless, because these, these uh, cultures are not only dead, but a lot of the time mythological in the first place. So, for example, Nagas, Ganymedes, Incubi, Lianan, Adze, and the Rephaim. Good. I'm glad I know that. Oh, next time I run into a Rephaim, I'll be like, yeah, dude, you like them Anopheles. <laughs> High five, bro. High five. Anopheles, man. Right? Yeah. Am I right? Now we get to see their Himsatis. <laughs> and John. Uh, What's a Himsati? So the Himsati is oh, your... a cubit. Oh, God, wait, why did I do that? <laughs> your Himsati is your animal form. Uh, for most people, it's going to be... A dog. Uh, a, a wolf. Yeah, a wolf or a bear. These guys have about the imagination level of your standard American furry. Which is that all of them are wolves and with dumb haircuts, and then occasionally one of them's like, but I'm a bat! And everyone's like, no, just put your fucking wolf mask on, Blaine. The weird thing for the Anopheles is, when it talks about their Himsadis, they're like, they are generally reptiles, such as snakes or lizards, however, they are descended from black leopards. But that has nothing to do with each other. Well, it Why also, would you say that? It also contradicts the other part of the book that describes the Anopheles, where it says that they are primarily black leopards, cats, snakes, or bats. Great. Whatever. Uh, okay. So, the one after that, we have the Arachne. Uh, that probably sounds familiar to you, because you know anything about anything at all. You know the Greek story, or you know every reference to anything being an Arachnid. Uh, they are mostly spider Himsati people, but their big thing is they don't feel emotion. So they're kind of the opposite of the Anopheles in that they don't want to feel any strong emotions one way or another. They actually will end up using, like, I'll take someone's emotion from them as a bargain in their, like, assassins. So uh, the Arachne also create traps because of course they do they have to weave things it actually, spiders lol in their appearance section it actually it says that they often weave their own clothes from their own silk which is amusing if you think that most of these races or these prides really want to avoid going into their himsadi forms yeah most of them spend like the vast majority of their time just looking like humans yeah which means they're just sitting there like grabbing silk out of their butt going yeah i'm gonna weave this yeah this is gonna make an awesome shirt i'm gonna make a butt silk shirt <laughs> Ah, uh, the butt silk I mean, shirt. I mean, I could go into my spider form and use my spinnerets to make this, but if I do that, then the sanguinary becomes impre- aware of my presence, and next thing you get, no, I got a bunch of bet noirs coming after me. Ah, uh, the bet noirs. Bet noir are basically evil shadow dogs. Uh, it's just animals that have been taken over by the sanguinary. Yeah. So it's like, oh, there's this house cat, and he's evil. Okay. All right. So he's a house cat. So he's then. just a house cat. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to scratch me. Okay. Again, yeah. house cat. Yeah. Yeah. Looks like he's going to be nice to me, and then all of a sudden he's got a razor claw buried into my knee by an inch. <laughs> uh, cats are dumb, and anyone who owns them is stupid. Oh, don't be mean. I have two friendly friendly cats. I know. I like your cats. They're great. They sometimes meow. In <laughs> fact, they often meow. They are meowing right now, probably, but we have them locked away. No podcat for you, audience. Yeah, you don't get it. That sweet, sweet podcat. <laughs> it's hard to get her to do it on command, anyway. All right, uh, let's see. What else do we know about them? Their Himsadis are spiders, mantises, and any insect. Yep. So they're, again, just sort of your standard assassin in any of these games where they have some clan or tribe or anything that is like, they're the assassins. It's always, oh, they're super emotionless and honorable and great at tactics and are basically ninjas. And if I could uh, just read one of the many pithy things they think about various stuff real quick so people can get a sense of what that's like. This is the Arachne's impression of the conundrum. The ultimate webs are to be found in these mazes of the Sanguinary's fractured flesh. The riddle of the Sanguinary will be solved when we have mastered them. Great. Okay. Thanks, book. Spiders. I'm I'm glad. Yeah, spiders. Uh, All right, we got the Banjax, which... (laughs) Fucking Banjax. Banjax. Banjax is the destroyers. They're immortals who'd like to punch people. Yeah. They, uh... Always hang out with their tiny robot, Daxters. Yeah, they... They, like, beat the crap out of people who 
break the rules mostly, which is weird, because there's a calling, which is another thing we'll get to, which was basically your job, but as a pride, they're known to essentially be the people who punish you for going against the rules, except that's a job, not a pride, so they're just sort of... It's it's weird. It's fucking weird. I don't yeah. know why. Also, the picture of them describes them as looking like flat-nosed George Michael Lita Fords wearing plastic Klingon battle armor <laughs> out near the Sphinx where a giant hand throws a key into space. Yeah, and that is Banjax uh, in a nutshell. Yeah, so I think we're done with them. You're pretty good there. That's the Banjax. Although I would, all, again, just like to really quickly read you one of these. The Banjax's view on humanity. Twilights are really cool, but they need some guidance. We should rescue them from the Sanguinary's taint. Ha ha ha! Ah, god damn it. Yeah, you thought I w- it was a good idea for me to read that, but now you know. I like the idea that some immortal Banjax is out there like, you know what? Twilights are cool. Yeah. I'm cool with Twilights. You know what? Humans are great. I, wh- whose opinion are these? Ugh. Just some Banjax? So they just find some random Banjax and we're like, hey man, what's your view on the conundrum? The conundrum is the ultimate web of punching things. If we learn to punch enough things punchily, we'll punch the sanguinary out of the conundrums. <laughs> uh, so we got the Dracul, which are just your Asian stereotype clan. Yep, they sure they are. They are kung fu masters, and their wisest elders speak only in tablets of jade. Yeah, they actually pull ta- uh, tablets of jade out of their mouths. And on the tablets are written what they have to say. Yes, that is correct. Ugh. Now, let's see here. Uh, their appearance is that they favor a wide variety of fashions, while among one another they often wear ancient oriental armor. The highest ranked members of the pride wear jade armor, which has come from out of the mouths of the Ky- of the Kyrin. Dracul also favor kimonos and other oriental forms of dress. Dragon symbology is always prominent in their attire, as are intricate belts and buckles, which are used to identify class distinction in the pride. See that? They even use martial art belts. Yep. They're just they're just Asian stereotypes. Of course, the the model they used for the photo, their George Michael y photo, is has a hot rod magazine aficionado mustache. Yeah. So it kind of just looks like a mullet a mullet dork. He looks like the sort of guy that knows whether or not his truck has overhead cams. The weird thing to me is they're called the Dracul. And it's... And yet they are not Dracul at all. No. Oh, they're they... Dra-lame. <laughs> no, the problem is, they're like, oh, we named our pride after, like, Vlad Dracul when he died, and we thought he was a cool guy, except then they just decided to go all Asian stereotype. Well, I, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, Vlad Dracul, the, the, or Vlad Tepes, the, uh, the, the impaler, yes. uh, was famously a huge weeaboo. Famously. Yeah. He was like, I'm going to defeat this opposing army using only my sweet katana moves. Oh, yeah, and he just talked for hours about how European weapons are so inferior to the multiple folded steel katana greatness. He had so many wall scrolls, it's not even funny. Yeah. All of, like, just bleach in one piece, just just (laughs) as far as the eye can see. (laughs) Vlad Tepes. God damn you, Vlad. And then, uh, you want another quote here? The, the, uh, Dracul's opinion... Of the Dominions. Let them be held up as examples of what can happen when the secret arrow strikes. We must rethink our abandonment of that world and heal it. We are the ones responsible for its destruction. Great. By the way, there's a lot of uh, apostrophes in that sentence. Just imagine that every single one of them is wrong, and you'll have an idea of the editing in this book. (laughs) Uh, Next up we have the Aramites, which are the uh, arrogant intellectuals. They, uh, oddly enough, are one of the only ones that have humans as a Himsadi form. Because normally people just look like humans. Mm -hmm. But they're actually animals. They just choose the human form because it's convenient and because Twilights have pretty much dominated the world. Yeah, but these are like, oh no, we took humans and gave them special immortal powers. Okay, great. Yep. Okay, and then the Aramites, like we mentioned, they're they're primarily humans or earlier primates, so they're like chimp Aramites and so on, uh, that are that are just evolved primates that act like humans. They are very human dominant. Like every one of their quotes is about how humanity is rad, and they don't like the other immortals like at all. Also, they are the ones who decided that dogs were rad, and that dog like dog is man's best friend is a saying that came from Aramites. And it's the only reason we have domesticated dogs, so 
Good job, Aramites. Good job on that one. Yes, here is their opinion on the profane. I don't even remember what the profane are. These breeds are no better than the animals, yet there may be those among them who are human in their soul, and these are worth our efforts to save, albeit secretly. <laughs> Great. Uh, I believe the profane are immortals who have gone over to the sanguinary side. Very good. Uh, we got the Magdalen, which are assholes. They're all pedagogues and crazy religious people. Mm-hmm. And uh, according to their picture, they like to look. They basically appear as Klingons in tube tops with wrestling belts. Yes, they are the tag team champions of the world. Yeah, sexy lady Klingons with drawn on boobs and uh, yeah, big wrestling belts. And uh, they are all about the uh, like getting immaculum for mortals. Yeah, they're, they're, like, they're basically yeah. vampires. Great, we're going to take all your immaculum. Yep. Give me an immaculum is... Jesus Christ, anytime you explain anything in this using the terms from the book, you have to then explain what the hell you were talking oh, about. Oh, just wait till I tell you what their opinion on sinning is. Yeah, okay. Immaculum, life force. What's sinning? Sinning. The opinion of the Magdalene on sinning is... It is our only means to survive due to the ban. In cursing us, Nimrod has cursed humanity with our depredations. Great. All right, so sinning is basically stealing immaculum from mortals, and uh, the ban is that you aren't supposed to steal immaculum from mortals, and that's something that was decided on by a council of well, immortals called the jury. The ban is specifically for them. They cannot get it from willing ones. Oh, that's right. So they right. have to steal it. Right. Which is stupid. Nimrod is an important ancient immortal hunter, the founder of the hunter pride of immortals, and uh, generally just sort of an important character who gets mentioned a lot. Well, there is a pride Nimrod as well. That's right. That's how it goes. Okay, and then you got your uh, your Morrigan. Morrigan are birds. They're, they're very birdy. They they have the storm stuff. Uh, they are tied into like the Arthurian legend for no good reason. Oh yeah, not at all. It doesn't make any sense to connect ravens and crows to the Arthurian legend, but whatever, they sure did it. They're like, oh yeah, and the, these guys are birds, and they're in charge of a bunch of stuff and storms. Also, they're Morgan Le Fay. You're like, what? Yeah, it's interesting to me that up until these guys, everyone has lived, like, in Tibet or Himalayas or something like that. Uh, mo uh, like, some of them are on the Amazon River Basin. That's where their creches are. Yeah. But these guys, they have Magonia, a mantle city in the sky which floats near the northern pole. Oh, sweet. So they have a setting for a Bioshock game. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they basically live in Dalaran. <laughs> For <laughs> floating over Northrend. There you go. Yeah. On a hearth to the Morrigan's crash. Yeah. Anyway, uh, they're basically leather bird bikers. Except, you know, that sounds rad, like something Palladium would write. So assume that it's just some dork in an idiot vest with a raven behind him. Dork in an idiot vest. Yeah, tell me I'm wrong. <sighs> you look at that picture and tell me that's not a dork. Oh, yeah. Idiot. Yeah. Now, that's someone who's like, I have no personality, and in... Uh, replacement of that, I have decided to get a motorcycle. Yeah, I got That's myself... That's the type of person he looks like. I got myself a leather fringe vest, and I grew out some crow hair. Like, the crow hair. The crow hair. Yeah, and now I'm all set. And then, here's their opinion on the Sanguinary. We battle the Sanguinary in the air, where its avatar eats a hole in the blanket of the clouds. Only in our supremacy can the beast be caged. This one calls up a question to me. Are they saying that the Sanguinary is responsible for global warming? Yes, actually, they're... The holes in the ozone layer are specifically caused by the Sanguinary's avatar in the habitat. Oh, how convenient that that's not being caused by humans, but instead is being caused by a magic sky god. Yeah, well, the problem is, the Sanguinary lives within the dreams of mortals, and he uses them like RAM in a computer. And so, humanity as a whole is being corrupted by the Sanguinary's various weird thoughts, and that... <laughs> Go through the Morphium into their dream state. Okay, at this point I'm starting to picture that the Sanguinary is just the bad guy from Fern Gully. Oh, see, I was picturing that he was the bad guy from the Care Bears movie. <laughs> well, at least I can name mine. Oh. Hexus. I cannot name mine. It's He's... a professor. Professor Darkheart or something like that. I think it might just be well, Darkheart. There, there was Darkheart, but there were also ones from the movies that were different. Oh, okay. Because Darkheart, I think, was the main one from the TV show. That is correct. I thought he was also the, the villain from the first one, where they meet the Care Bear Cousins. Look how much I know about this. I love the Care Bear Cousins. If there's one thing that I'm known for loving, 
It is the Care Bear Cousins. Yeah, no, that, that's fair. You got a monkey one and a horse one. A lion. There's a penguin, I'm pretty sure. Chill heart, I want to say. There's a raccoon. There is a raccoon. Uh, it's clever heart or something like that. Yeah. 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 And you got bear fart. Yeah, bear fart. Bear, 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 bear fart penguin. <laughs> Uh, All right, then you got Lord. then you got Nimrod, which is the hunters. They hate uh, people using serenades and causing ripples. Mm-hmm. They don't like when people cast spells. In this game, are called serenades, which is when you use your magic super voice box to vibrate the universe in such a way that things change to your liking. And the dominions were destroyed because everyone cast enough spells at each other that it fucked everything up. That's why they're in the habitat. Mm-hmm. And they are the ones who enforce the ban on singing at each other. Yes, they also have an a, obsession with handcuffs, and so they work handcuffs into all of their their uh, fashion. <laughs> Good. That's great. I love everything about that. Yeah, it says here, I like this, Nimrod's dress is always holocaustic in appearance. Nice. Holocaustic. So, wait, what, do they do they dress like SS officers, or do they dress in the, in like, rags and prisoner garb? Which one is it? Well, they, they dress, uh, in Holocaust cloaks, which are cloaks that are meant to be set on fire. Oh, yes, the Holocaust cloaks, as appearing in The Princess Bride. Yes. That's what they dress in. Holocaustic is a terrible word to use in this situation. Do you, I assume they probably meant, like, post-apocalyptic, or... No, I assume Holocaustic means they look like they're supposed to be set on fire. <laughs> well, they certainly read like they're supposed to be set on fire. This book reads like it should be set on fire. <laughs> Maybe we hey! Should, let's burn these books. Well, you want to hear their opinion on the Morphium? No, but read it anyway. <laughs> if we forsook that place, the Sanguinary would dream in an empty hall. We enter there only to prevent other prides from breaking the silence in the very lair of the monster. Great. That's what all of their quotes are, by the way. For example, Sanguinary. It would go to sleep and forget us all if we would only keep quiet. Without our clamor, it would lose purpose. Why then do so many immortals insist on trying to provoke it? It must be allowed to sleep. The Sanguinary is the genesis of us all. Destroying it destroys ourselves. I mean, possibly? It's kind of like these guys have a deeply religious conviction to stopping all the other immortals from having any fun. They're, they have a they have an unfounded belief that if every other immortal just stops doing stuff, then the Sanguinary will shut the hell up too. Well, yeah, it's... Look, every time one of you casts a spell... It makes the Sanguinary notice you. If you just stop doing that shit and hang out for eternity, we'll be fine. Yeah, but that's boring. Oh, it's super boring. I mean, maybe for like four million years you could be like, all right, okay, I won't cast any spells. But after four million years, you're like, you know what's real fucking boring? Doing nothing. I'm going to yell at you and cause your hair to turn into snakes. Whatever, I don't care. Incidentally, these guys have Himsadis that are shadows of animals. Doesn't matter what animal, it's just a shadow of the animal instead of the actual animal. Great. That is very helpful to me, because I know what that should be. It's supposed to sound super rad, is what it is. It's supposed to, you're supposed to be like, ooh, my animal... I'm my Shadow him- Wolf. My Himsadi is the shadow of a wolf. My Himsadi is Shadow the Hedgehog. Ha <laughs> ha, god damn it. <laughs> By the way, that's going to be my bonus character. My bonus character. <laughs> shadow the Hedgehog. Perry are the, the next one. The Perry. P-E-R-I. The Periwinkles. The Perry Mason clan are immortals made from weapons. They're immortals made from lava and stone that can take weapon form and are weapons. They are living weapons. They are weapons. And they're, they're T-1000s. They're, they're Himsati is weapons. Uh, or stones. So or, they can either be like uh, a transformer and be like, I turn into a gun and you can use me, Starscream. Or... They can be like, ah, turn my arm into a sword and be all T-1000. Yeah. Now, notably, Perry were heavily involved in the first war, the Shouting War, so almost all of them died at that point, which means that all the Perry you encounter in the game are children. So if, you want, if you're the weirdo who wants to play a child immortal w- with his shirt off, according to this picture, <laughs> then, uh, I mean, literally, that is like some Henry Darger T-1000 shit. Yeah. So if you want to be a, uh, a-, a immortal child beautiful blonde child boy. A golden god. Uh, yeah. Then you play as the Perry because they are all children. These are the creepiest ones. Yeah. Notably, everyone is always choosing whatever appearance they want, so there's no reason why they have to appear as children by the rules of this game, but they do. Yeah, because they were... Okay, so the Children's Crusade is where they got most of their new members. They just saved all the children from it. However, that also means that all of them are just humans? Yes. Like, 
I know that the Aramites are mostly supposed to be human-based and then became that, except now the Perry should be, because they just took human children and turned them into immortals. It's not like they took the weapons of the human children and turned them into immortals. Give me those weapons. No, this, for some reason the Perry, uh, this didn't happen to me last week, but this week they're kind of creeping me out, because it's a race of golden, beautiful children who can turn into things that you hold in your hand. (laughs) Good. Right? That's, that is not creepy at all. No. I am no, not creeped out. No. There's nothing Nambla at all about this this page of this book. Up next is the dorkiest looking idiot in the in the entire collection, the Phoenix. Yep. The Phoenix are weird. Like, they mostly got killed off and then came back, so that's why they're called oh, the Phoenix. Like the, like, like the legend of the Phoenix. Oh, isn't this guy a little on the nose? This is kind of like the Arachne to me. Like, at least the Arachne aren't just called the Spiders. But the Phoenix is like, oh yeah, everyone knows that legend. It feels like they should have changed this name up a little more. You'd think that. I mean, no. they changed Tautha to, or Tuatha to Tautha. Ugh. Could they call these guys the Phoenix? Probably. The Phoenixi. <laughs> yes, the Phoenixi. That's what they are from now on. <laughs> the Phoenixi. Uh, and they are the ones who hold Palladium, and Palladium are not purveyors of fine books everywhere. In this game, instead, Palladium is the only way you can heal poison damage as an immortal. Well, the actual... Uh, palladium, for real, is is a alloy of silver... No, that's Electrum I'm thinking of. It's uh, Palladium is an actual alloy. It's like golden titanium or something like that. It's a real... Yeah, no, it, Palladium actually exists. It does it's exist. It's super expensive and, and doesn't matter. Very rare, and I don't believe it appears on Earth independently. No. So, So it's a super rare thing. In this game, if you're a poisoned immortal, your poison doesn't heal because you're too immortal for that. So poison hurts a lot longer... Which means you need uh, some palladium to cure that, and these guys have it. Yeah, palladium is the one thing that can draw, like, poison or toxins or whatever out of your body, and this is the clan that apparently found all of the old trees whose sap is what the palladium is. Fucking whatever, I don't care. You know, the nice thing is that this you can tell that this book is written pre-Facebook, because nowadays, I think we all know that the proper way to draw toxins out of your body is a poultice of lemon and garlic... Maybe some apple cider vinegar. Look, all I'm doing is I'm on a juice cleanse right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, real soon, every toxin in my body is going to be gone. Oh, yeah. They'll just be drawn right out through the soles of my feet or something. <laughs> I'm going to put magnets in my shoes and drink nothing but lemon juice and sriracha for five days. And then at the end of that, totally cleanse. Look, people, all I'm saying is that my professor ran a study that proved that, that uh, liberals are stupid. And, uh, and that professor's name was Albert, Albert Einstein. Einstein. And, and I got married to him, and we've been married five years. And then everyone stood up and clapped. <laughs> and then we all sang Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> so there you go. And oh my god, we have been talking forever, and we aren't even through the prides yet. All right, let's, let's get just, this done. Okay, there's the Tautha, which are... Dirt druids. They're, they're druids, they're elves, they're brownies. They're any legend that's Celtic... Is they, them. They have the same model, which is that, that, uh, as the Dracul, which means it's some dirt bag with a hot rod magazine trying to be a druid. <laughs> it's dirt stash with dumb hair, and he's a druid. Yeah. But he's mostly just changing the oil on your tree. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> this, I think this tree has overhead cams. And then finally, the Terat, which are the super Himsati lovers. They like their Himsati, and they try to stay in their Himsati form as often as possible. Uh, for some reason, the picture of one is a zebra centaur. Uh, Millie Vanilli. Yeah. And the centaur zebra Millie Vanilli wields a rose and a dagger. <laughs> Good for him. There you go. They they like their Himsadi form and they stay it whenever stay in it whenever possible. They think that being human has polluted the immortal mind. Yes. So they're like, oh, because you're staying a human for so long, you are now thinking like a human and we need to think like our animal selves. Right. Great, those are all the prides. You can choose one of those. That will only have one effect in the game, which is that it will make certain serenades cheaper for you to purchase with XP. That's it. Yep. All right, great. Uh, coming up next is the calling. Well, this is basically the classes of the game, except that uh, classes do something and these do nothing. No, it's just your job. Yeah, it's it would your be job. like, oh, we're playing a game and I decided my guy's a baker. Well, does that mean anything? No. Yeah, I have the baking skill, and I have feats that are related to baking. And No, it would be like if I just said I was a baker, and they go, oh, did you get any baking skills? No, I just said I was a baker. Yeah, in this game, that's all your choice is. You can be like, I'm a sleeper. My job is to sleep and fight the morphium. Oh, okay, but do you have any skills related to that? Maybe, if I took them. Yeah, it doesn't make it so that you do anything. And again, you may remember this from the uh, first part. As a starting character... 
you're just some guy who is slowly remembering he was actually an immortal. Except they also want you to get a job right off the bat. So well, you're like, hey, what are you? Oh, I'm a school teacher that just realized, slowly, is starting to remember that he's an immortal being. But I also need to pick the job of being able to be a sleeper and fight people in the dream well, realm. Well, thankfully, it does, these are optional, and you can choose one later, and it does mention that you maybe shouldn't start with one right away because you have no idea. But they're in there, and they're a major part of the game. So we got Sleeper, which sleep and fight in the dream world. You and protect dreams, and you try to make it so that people uh, don't get nightmares. You've got Emissary, and they are literally just messenger immortals, and they have to get messages to important people in important ways. You've got High Binders, which are uh, hunters. They, I think they they go after the uh, profane, the ingenue. Oh, the ingenue. Okay, they go after people who have forgotten that they're immortals and go find them. They also rescue kidnapped immortals. They're basically immortals that go after other immortals. They're one of my favorite pictures in the book because there's some shirtless vampire and there's someone holding him at gunpoint, except that they are holding the gun completely sideways. It what? It's not that the gun is turned sideways. It's that he's essentially just holding the barrel. Yeah. Or not the barrel, the, uh, the grip the, of the grip the grip of the trigger sideways. It's, it's so weird looking. It looks like he wants to shoot that and then just smack himself in the face from the recoil. <laughs> okay, anyway, you got the juggler, and they are the least interesting and yeah. distinct thing the, in this book. You've got the juggler. They and do stuff. They, uh, they put on face paint. They do a lot of meth. Uh, they listen to the worst hip hop ever. Oh yeah, yeah. They'll they'll show you their tits for a dollar or fifty cents if you're a down ass ninja. The <laughs> juggler. The juggler. Yeah, they're they're like the least distinct thing in here. They they do odd jobs and are are important for keeping the balance or whatever. Then you've got the Slayer and the Fucking Slayer, Slayer. Uh, has a rain of blood mm -hmm. and he will dehumanize himself. And face to bloodshed. They uh, they fight the agents of the Sanguinary, and they are also the only ones who are able to kill other immortals legally by the Code of the Immortals. Great. Great. You got Keepers. They're bodyguards. Moving on. You got Probes. They are spies. Moving on. <laughs> huh. And you got Scourge. The Scourge is weird because it's... Uh, I guess it's kind of like the uh, internal police keepers... Like, they're the ones who go, oh, if one of our own pride fuck up, scourges are the ones who damage them. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh yeah, we mete out punishment for anyone who fucks up in our own group. Also, there is literally no way that that picture of a scourge was not originally a dude. <laughs> they took a dude's face and photoshopped his body into a sexy lady body. That's what happened. There is no way that is not what happened. He looks like Rob Riggle. <laughs> Great. So, moving on. Also, he's standing in front of a giant field of geodes. <laughs> the giant field of geodes. Great. So there you go. Choose choose those, and then you've got yourself a basic lore-style character. Now, all of this, we've been talking for like 45 minutes about this, and we still haven't even gotten into all of the terms in this. Let me just... Okay, I flipped to a page. There's the beginning fiction. So this is the... Introduction to this, in addition to the timeline, is a uh, the opening fiction work that you get in every one of these. But they all look completely incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't read this and know what's going on, is the main problem. So, like, uh, let's see. I tried to reti retreat deeper, to settle into ennui, so that I wouldn't feel the pain of the priest's relegarum, as if mere flesh could serve as a barrier to protect my small identity. His faith was already audible, a wail of ephemeral strings, climbing to heights, collecting immaculum like drops of dew on a web. Dew. There was a gathering heat, a hungry fire. I cut loose a cerebral scream, heard some of it escape from out of my mouth. Okay, yes, so, escape. I know, I heard escape. So what you're saying is that most of this book is just Fifty Shades of Grey. Oh yeah. I mean, all that character needed to say was, oh wow, a couple of times. <laughs> Wow! Wow! Man, that's... Okay, Owen Wilson starring in Fifty Shades of Grey, that's... Oh my god, make, Hollywood, make that happen. Make that happen, please. Wow! Wow, Wait, Mr. Grey! There's, wow. a, there's a lot of fisting in this contract. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, in addition to that, there's the Darkle. And the <laughs> Femme Darkle. Darkle. The Darkle is a chunk of conundrum that was found inside of an Absalom's brain that is especially evil. 
Uh, I think it has something to do with Relegarum. The Femdarkle is the I love, box it's kept in. I love reading what the actual thing about the Darkle says. So, <laughs> the Darkle occasionally shows up. Like, it says that the Nimrod were the ones who originally held it. Yeah. If you go look up the Darkle in the dumb footnotes that are the glossary of this, it just says, A physical manifestation of Abaddon found encrusted in the brain of Samael in Absalom after it had died. After a protracted history of tragic influence, the vampiric ruby-like substance was placed within a receptacle, the Femdarkle, until stolen in AD 1990. Then you go look up the Femdarkle, and it's just a receptacle for the Darkle. Yeah. Stop it. Just so, stop it. Okay, so the Darkle is a chunk of pure destruction found inside the brain of the ancient dinosaur god named Samael that uh, can be used for destruction-y things and is kept inside of a box that's built to hold it, which is called the Femdarkle. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't... <laughs> the Femdarkle. An automaton built by the Anopheles in Sheba that reincarnated Samael until it was beheaded by Menelik. Now the head is given the same name. Any skin contact with the Femdarkle causes blood loss, and prolonged exposure to it induces the dream state in living things and vampirism in inanimate objects. What? The Femdarkle's theft in 1990 began the Invisible War. You'd think that a book called... Immortal, the Invisible War, would tell you more about the thing that started it, and yet the Femdarkle is barely mentioned in passing. Okay, so what I'm getting from this is that the Femdarkle is a, ro- a sexy lady robot head that... Uh, no, it- because it was a reincarnation of Samael, so it's okay, a so sexy lady, lady dinosaur, dinosaur head. Sexy lady dinosaur head that makes tables and, and blankets want your blood. Yes. Okay, correct. that's that's good. <laughs> Uh, it, it puts humans to sleep, and it makes their clothes hunger for blood. Yep. So if you touch it with your bare skin, it drinks your blood, but also makes you sleepy if you're a dude. But if you put it on your table, then your table's like, oh, I'm gonna bite you. I'm gonna bite you real hard. Ooh, ooh, I wonder what Jesus' blood tastes like. Ooh, I sparkle in the daylight. <laughs> Good. Which vampire type would you like to go with? You have Old World, you've got... Uh, well, the problem is, if I go with Twilight, then in the context of this book, that's just a human, because humans are Twilights. <laughs> Christ. Okay, uh, we are at 50 minutes. Would you like to talk about your favorite and least favorite aspects of Immortal, the Invisible War? Uh, I know you would, because I'm going to start asking you anyway. John, <laughs> what would you say is your favorite part of Immortal, the Invisible War? Oh, God. Okay. The Serenades. The serenades are the only thing in this book that are remotely interesting. The idea of casting spells through singing it into being, while not entirely, like, specifically original to just that, it's at least different enough that I appreciate it. And they work with, ostensibly, your skills. So, like, okay, I've got a skill in basket weaving because that exists, or I've got a skill in board gaming, which is a skill in this book. There's like 300 skills in this book. People who are listening to this should know that this is episode 2. In episode 1, we discussed how this game has 375 skills. And so if I have board gaming as a skill, and I want to combine that with a song that lets me transform things, then I can be like, oh, great. I'm going to turn this Monopoly $1 bill into a $500 bill. I'm going to win at Monopoly. I'm going to win at Monopoly by cheating from singing a song that transforms the universe. That's what I'm using my universe-shaping powers to do, is cheat at a Monopoly game. Very nice. So that, at least, the idea that you could combine spells with other things to do unique effects is interesting to me. So that... I'll go ahead and say is the best thing that this book did. Sure. Okay, for you, I'm gonna best go with, thing. I'm going to go with the Femme Darkle, because <laughs> sexy lady robot dinosaur vampires, and just their heads in particular, are my fetish. I like that you decided that it was sexy just because it had the word Femme in it. What else does Femme possibly mean in this kind? I mean, I know it doesn't just have to mean sexy, it could just mean female. Yes. So I'm happy to say that it's a female sexy, or sorry, I keep saying sexy, a female... <laughs> Robot yeah, vampire just means it's a female sexy robot. It's a female robot vampire dinosaur head. Yeah, that that's awesome. 
No, okay. For reals, though, I'm going to say that my favorite thing in this game is the basic concept of hostiles I thought was kind of cute, that your character just automatically succeeds at things if it wasn't for all this pesky reality getting in his way. I thought that was kind of neat. I mean, granted, it doesn't stick the landing, like, even slightly, because all they really become by the end of the game is, oh, see if you roll a zero on these six dice. Yeah, if the auto-fail didn't exist in this game, it would be almost workable. The idea that you would roll for everything and uh, trying to get around certain obstacles would actually become useful to you. Like, if I was super observant and not very good at shooting people, but I had to shoot someone through fog, then the fact that if I rolled really well on my observing thing, it would just... Roll over your shooting. Yeah. From the shooting. No, I thought a lot of that was neat and flexible and had it had a cool core concept. The problem is, when you're reading it, the very first thing you think is, oh, that's just a bunch of chances to roll a zero and screw you. Okay, that's bad. I don't like that part of it. The idea, though, is kind of neat. The whole, oh, immortals are perfect at things. It's just that physics is constantly telling them otherwise. So you have to get your way around that. There's all these hostile forces in the universe. I thought that was kind of clever. Yeah. All right. Your least favorite thing about this game. Okay, so hearkening all the way back to the Sky Realms of Joe Rune, don't make up dumb bullshit words for your game. I hate you so much. Oh, come on, it didn't make up that many words. If you think about it, all it did was just use regular, normal words in places where you shouldn't, and thus make the game even more confusing. Darkle. Well, okay, yeah, Darkle, Sunedrion, but also Conundrum. That's a real word. Yes, but Sanguinary. It's not that's used to be that. I actually hate it. L- Probably more than Sky Realms of Jorun, because when that does it, they're like, oh, it's 15 million years in the future, and languages evolved, and this is what this word would roughly equate to in your time. And I hate it. It makes me real angry, Hmm. but I understand. I go, okay, sure. You're some weird civilization in the same way that if it's like, all right, uh, orcs call a sword whatever. I'd be like, okay, sure. That's stupid, and I don't need to know that. But I can at least understand. Mm-hmm. But when they go, all right, what's this guy? He's the Sanguinary from the Crucible, and we've decided to call this our Halos of Immaculum. I'm like, oh, just don't. Just don't do that. Yeah. Please don't do that, because it means you can't tell anyone else about this game. Like, you have to do a immortal to English dictionary in order to tell someone what is happening in your game. Otherwise, you sound like a fucking crazy person. Sure enough, that is absolutely correct. Uh, it, this game is so hard to read, and actually that's going to fire right into what my least favorite thing is. Give it to me. My least favorite thing in this game, and let me just go ahead and say that I'm not an expert, and I am uh, not trying to say that this is correct for everybody, but this book, on the sliding scale of not dense enough to too dense, is like German chocolate cake. <laughs> it, it makes no goddamn sense. You have to read it like six times before things start coming together. <laughs> I like the idea that German chocolate cake makes no sense. Every time I try to talk to German chocolate cake, I'm like, what are you talking about, German chocolate? And he's like, Sprechen halte I'm like, damn it, German chocolate. Yeah, if he isn't, knows what you did. (laughs) He's in a bar. Stupid basement wizard. Stop knowing what I'm here to do. (laughs) Okay, so the game's just entirely too dense and up its own butt. It's like unreadable. I mean, we're at the point where John and I can carry on a regular conversation about it, but that's because we're professionals. I know I just said I wasn't, but I changed my mind. <laughs> no, you're not an expert. You are a professional. There you go. I'm a, a pro- professional expert. I'm a prof- <laughs> 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 Look, people, I'm not here to brag. I'm here to describe how the game works and brag. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the problem with this is if you're trying to talk to someone about it and they don't know the book, like, haven't read it, they're just gonna go, uh, why? Why are you saying these things to me? Yeah, it it takes forever to figure out how to play this, and it it forces the players to answer so many dumb questions about what they want to do, and ultimately, for no reason. Like, when you read, did you actually get to the section in this book where there's a play example? Oh, I read this book cover to cover twice. Yeah, so you've read the play example, where, like, three characters go and fight, like, like, investigate a, a building, and there's, like, a evil shadow dog in there, or cat, that, a cat that attacks one of them, and it's it doesn't have anything to do with how that character feels the universe was created. Yeah, the, again, the problem is, this book starts you out as a guy. You are some dude who barely 
remembers a little bit that they are an immortal. So you're like, what were you? Oh, I was, uh, I was just some school teacher or I was a janitor or I was a fireman or whatever you happen to be. And then you get a barest glimpse that you're like, oh, wait a minute. I'm starting to remember I'm actually something greater than that. But the book is 90% given over to, oh, well, all of this shit has happened for the past 65 million years. You're like, that is not going to matter to my character almost at all. That's perfect. That's a perfect way to describe my problem with it, which is that the game kind of misses the theme. It's this big book of, oh, immortal super gods are rampaging through the world, and here's a million things you need to know about them in great detail. What's my character? Oh, he's probably like a like a janitor or something who who just realizes that for some reason, sometimes people are extra nice to him, and then he has to fight a cat. <laughs> like... Oh, okay. Does, so, what's the, all this nonsense in the book for? Oh, that's for super advanced players. There is no section in here that's the shallow end of the crazy pool. Yeah. Immortal reads like this is a expansion book. Yeah. Like, you would have already had Immortal the Invisible War main book, which was, you're a guy who's just figuring out you have powers. Isn't that rad? You, there's a hidden world deep beneath and. You'll figure out more about that on the next thrilling episode of Immortal. Yeah, except instead you're just chucked into the deep end of this thing, and it's just solid crazy, and maybe there's one person in your group that gets it. And he's also that guy that's always reading that Time Cube stuff on the line. He's like, yeah, all this makes sense to me. Imagine four him Saudis on the edge of a cliff. Yeah, that's... So, uh, the tone is really weird in this book, and it makes it hard to want to play it. Would you play this game? Uh, now... Yeah. Now that I have read it, Twice. yes, I would. Yeah, I would play this if only to have it under my belt as a thing I can say. Yes, I've played an actual game of Immortal: The Invisible War and can tell you about it. So what you're saying is that basically this is like the threesome of RPGs. <laughs> <laughs> no, it would be nowhere near as good, but definitely as awkward. Oh, okay, so it's like the one-legged person of RPGs. We're like, I slept with a one-legged person. Yeah, let me tell you about it. It was. It was definitely an experience I had. Yeah, that was interesting. That's okay, fair enough. Right. And uh, would you would you play this with me? In the fields of gold? <laughs> uh, sure. Sure, I'd play this game. Because it's, like I said, the dice mechanic isn't all that annoying. And now that I've read it, I know that all of the foo that surrounds the character creation is basically just nothing window dressing. So it's a very simple game once you ignore that and just build your character. It should take you no time at all. No, I mean, your character is going to be real dumb and focused, and the problem with having any game where you have 375 skills is, if I want to do something, I'm probably not able to because it's covered by something I didn't get specifically. Well, honestly, you're just going to take the broadest sounding skills and just talk your DM into everything. Because <laughs> I mean, if you think about it, you could just skip the vast majority of them that are stupid profession stuff that will never come up. Well, yeah, you're like, oh, what are you? Oh, I've got... Gem setting. Yeah. No. Systems administration. No, okay. I, why would I take that? Instead, you take something like knife fighting, and then you just talk your DM into thinking that a big knife is basically a small sword, and you're fine. <laughs> just just go forward. Don't worry about it. That's that's the way you do it. Okay, so there you go. Uh, I would also play this game just because I feel like it would be an interesting challenge. However, do not take that as an endorsement. Please don't read this book. Uh, I'm pretty sure it has forever altered my brain chemistry. Yeah, Man, that's, that's a thing. Don't don't read. Yeah, this is a this is your sticker warning on the front of the book. Caution will make you want to play this game, even though you really shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I kind of want to play this game, but in the same way that I, you know, when you get stand up on the edge of a cliff and you have that little sense in the back of your head that's like, just take that step, just go forward. Hey, man. And, when you're stand when I'm standing up there next to you, and I'm like, hey, man, just push push Jeff off this cliff. <laughs> that's why I never go to your cliffs with you. <laughs> Not since last time. No. <laughs> that was that was unfortunate. All right, so as always, this has been the System Mastery Podcast. You can find us at systemmasterypodcast.com for all your bit latest in old role playing game reviews. Leave us comments on the website or find us at System Mastery at Twitter or Facebook or Gmail. Just drop us lines there if you have books you'd like to recommend, questions you'd like to ask for our afterthought podcast, anything along those lines. We're very open to communication. Just send us what you want. You can buy our dumb t-shirts at tpublic slash system mastery. We have like six of them for sale there. They're neat. Also, you can support our Patreon, Patreon slash system mastery. If you support us in even the smallest way, you get access to our bonus content, which is us making characters 
for the game that we just reviewed. I really wanted to jump in there and add something, but then I realized I had completely spaced out during that and had no idea what you had or had not already said. (laughs) Actually, I think that was probably my best plug section to date. I think I mentioned everything without saying anything stupid. Good. Yeah. Good job. Yeah, I didn't get to Movie Mastery, so would you like to take that? Yeah, we've got Movie Mastery. It's December for at least another week after you're hearing this, Mm -hmm. and we've got one more holiday-themed movie to do So get those suggestions in before we get that done. And then after that, we've got normal movies as always. And it's just what you, the listener, want us to suffer through. Because I would say it's what you want us to watch, but it's always just bad movies. Because you love it. You love our pain. Why do you love our pain? It's true. I don't think anyone wants a review of a good movie. But then again, it's because we're typecast. We have become the bad uh, role-playing game review people. So, I mean, it's not like anyone's going to send us a good role-playing game. No. And even if they did, we'd hate it. We'd hate everything about it. Yep. We hate your favorite role-playing game. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that. you obligated. You're listening. You know who you are. Well, we I, hate it. You know, not to give it away, but next week we are reviewing one of my favorite role-playing games. Yeah. Third edition. Yeah, two weeks from now. Anyway, that's all from System Mastery Podcast. Thanks so much. Have a wonderful week. Thrilling conclusion. Bitches. Boner. Jackson. Boner Jackson. Bitches, Boner Jackson. Bitches, Boner Jackson knows football. <laughs> <laughs> the bow in Bo Jackson stands for boners. <laughs> Bitches, Boner Jackson knows football. <laughs> See, I was just inventing a new character called Bitches Boner Jackson. Everyone loves Bitches Boner Jackson. He's famed footballsman, Bitches Boner Jackson. I strongly recommend that Christian teens stay away from dancing, mainly because some people would just not be able to respect a person who attended dances. Yeah. By Mike Huckabee. Michael Huckabee. Mike Buckahee. Miguel Jucklebees. You're still recording, by the way. Oh, I know. This, this. this is the start of the episode. Yeah. Hi, John. How you doing this week? So good. So oh. good, it puts your ass to sleep. All right, we're killing this. We're Kill. killing all of this. Kill everyone. Everything's gone. <laughs>